All right. Let's just stay standing for the scripture. It's brief. Now, this is a little bit different of a Christmas message, but we've been talking about Joseph for three weeks, and I really want to finish that since we've touched on uh, all of the Christmas elements, and I think this will be a blessing to you. But it is a little bit unusual. Let's read this together. When Jesus had finished telling these stories and illustrations, he left that part of the country. He returned to Nazareth, his hometown, When he taught there in the synagogue, everyone was amazed and said, Where does he get this wisdom and the power to do miracles? Then they scoffed, He's just the carpenter's son. And we know Mary, his mother, and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. All his sisters live right here among us. Where did he learn all these things? Is that it? Should be one more. Guess not. Oh well. (laughs) Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for our opportunity to be together. May your blessing be on us today. May your word challenge us. And may the life of Joseph give us something to think about that perhaps we hadn't thought about before. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Just out of curiosity, <clears throat> how many of you noticed that we had video on Facebook this week? Anybody? Okay. Now that's something we're going to refine and get better and better at. We're not looking to be on TV, but we do want to be able to keep in touch with people, and we want our folk, when they miss, to be able to easily and comfortably uh, have, a, have a spiritual meal. So I think this will be a blessing. But we also want to stay aware that with this being um, recorded and more and more people seeing it, um, it puts us on trial to be our best just a little bit. So let's all stay conscious of that. I want to talk to you today about Joseph using his gifts. We know that they brought gifts to Christ, but Joseph was a gifted man and He was in a very difficult situation in life, as we've talked about. And to recover and make the most of his life, he had to use his gifts. Uh, Did you ever receive a great Christmas gift and just ignore it? Anybody? No, of course not. Eventually, if you do ignore it, you're likely to regret the decision. Now, when we were first married, it would be... Um, very accurate to say financially things were pretty lean and that was true for a good while and every Christmas Mary's folks would give us a check they would give us five hundred dollars I can't tell you how big that was five hundred dollars we invested it in life. You say, well, what did you do with it? Did you go on vacation? <laughs> no. We, we made sure we ate. We made sure the kids had clothes. We made sure the utility bills were paid. It, it was close, but that was life. And it was a great gift. And that was good. I, I was wonderful. What would you have thought if I just collected those checks? What if we framed them? Aren't they generous? Look at the beautiful check that they gave us in 1980. $500. And look, here's the one from 81. It's slightly different color. And and look, the signature's a little different. Isn't it nice? We got a frame here right beside the other one. And and here's 82. And here's 83. And here's 84. Uh, 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 No, no interest was added. No cost of living increase, just $500. How many of you would think that was a little nuts? Okay. Truth is, I couldn't wait to cash that check. If we did something special, it was usually something really modest, like maybe we got Little Caesar's Pizza or something like that. And uh, 
at Christian Care the other day, we, they were saying that a Little Caesars pizza place is going to go in at Dixon, and, and we have too many pizza places. I thought, well, that's heresy all on its own. But uh, one of them said, I don't know why we need a Little Caesars pizza. And I said, well, you know, when we were young married, sometimes Little Caesars was all we could afford. And a couple others of them said, yeah, that was true for us too. But a gift like that is an amazing thing. And you relish the opportunity to have it and you want to make the most of it because that's the way life's supposed to work. What if they gave me the gift with this stipulation? I want you to make sure that you do something good with it. And if you'll do something good with it, I'm going to lavish you with more. I'm going to give you more than you really can understand, more than you can really comprehend. Would that sound like a good deal to you? Sure. And if I ignored it, would that sound very smart? No. Now, this is the Christmas story. What I just told you is the Christmas story for most people. The gift and the offer are out there. Forgiveness, redemption, the opportunity to have a richer life of better quality is out there. Jesus isn't just offering forgiveness. He's offering more, although forgiveness is the big part of the package. But if you understand what was given, you also understand that he says, hey, I'm giving you this gift. Now, if you will do what is good with this gift... I will reward you lavishly. When I return, I'll be ready to reward the faithful. And all of us who love the Lord would say, wow, how does anybody ignore that? Nobody should ignore that because the greatest giver offers this gift to the most needy. And then on top of it, he says, go ahead, try me, do good. See if I don't keep my promise. See if it isn't worth every effort. See if it isn't worth every sacrifice. See if it isn't worth every good choice. See if it isn't worth every act of denial when it's something that might be attractive that you're just not going to give in to because it's not good. Test me. And so Christians for centuries now have said, Lord, I'll take you up on that deal. I'll follow you the best I can. And yet others we see in the church, outside the church, some ignore the gift, some ignore the offer, some ignore the bonus program. I don't know about you, but I really want to hear ding, 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 this is the bonus round. Some people do this with Christmas. They see the greatest gift, which is Jesus, and they add Jesus to their list of competing options. Well, you know, I like Jesus. He's pretty nice, but I got to do this and I got to do that. And if I have time, I'll give Jesus a few minutes. You know, there's a couple of famous poems. One's a... a few minutes of God, another is uh, a few ounces of God. You know, the idea is, I'll have a little bit of God, but I I don't want it to cost me. I don't want it to annoy me. I don't want it to make my life uncomfortable. I don't want anybody to look at me and think, oh, I'm strange because, you know, I'm part of this Christian thing. So Jesus competes for attention. I want us to think about G- Joseph because I believe with Joseph there was no competition. Joseph just said, Jesus is first. God is in my first place. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to sacrifice if necessary in behalf of him. And that's the life I choose. 
And yet we've seen in the last three weeks, Joseph had all kinds of trouble. And that was clearly and obviously God's choice. Now, Joseph has been the subject of scandal and gossip over things he cannot prove. I mean, think about how difficult that was, even for people who had tender hearts. Yes, folks, my wife's having a baby. No, folks, I'm not the father. Really? Well, who's the father? God. Oh, brother. I like the cartoon with the bumper sticker on the back of the camels, you know. My son's an honor student. The next one says, my son is an athlete. And the next one is Mary and Joseph. It says, my son is the son of God. Pretty good. But difficult. Difficult in so many ways. His life was continually disrupted. Joseph, after the birth of Christ, had to flee for his life. They left for Egypt. That meant starting all over. That meant, as we talked about last week, a difficult culture. And just about the time he had probably got settled, the angel came to Joseph again and said, you got to move again. Wow. So you have a business where you live, you move, you reestablish yourself in some form or another, and you got to leave, and now on the way to where you think you're going, God says, ah, no, 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 I'm not going to have you go that way, and you really want to say, God, are you schizophrenic this month or what? But he follows the Lord. When God spoke to Joseph in the third dream, the family went to Nazareth, and Joseph again established himself in Nazareth. Now, we don't have a lot of facts about Joseph, but we put these things together based on what we can see with the things the Scripture does tell us because God doesn't speak without issues being important. So one of the things you see in Joseph uh, is perseverance. Joseph really is unstoppable. He's faced with the crisis of the public testimony. He's faced with the crisis of having to go register to vote. He's faced with the crisis of having a baby in a manger. He's faced with the crisis of having to flee to Egypt. Now he has to go somewhere else. And now he, he's on his way there and he has to go somewhere else. And so now he's got to settle again. This man perseveres. It's no wonder a lot of children are named Joseph. Joseph persevered against popular opinion to obey God. How rare is that becoming in our day? How often do we consider that? Is what I'm about to choose to do something God has an opinion about? Is there some issue, some principle I should have concern over? How am I going to obey God in the circumstance I'm faced with? Joseph persevered to follow God's leading in spite of discomfort and inconvenience. In Nazareth, in Nazareth, Joseph perseveres to rebuild their lives. Now the question is, how are their lives built? We only have just a few facts. In fact, between the time they come to Nazareth and the time Jesus begins his public ministry, we only have one little section of Luke chapter 2 to tell us any facts about the life Mary and Joseph and Jesus lived together. But there are some facts there. Oh, we wish for more. <laughs> I always wish for more. If God would have written the Bible big enough to satisfy my curiosity, I doubt that we could have carried it around. And I think most of us feel that way. We read these things and go, wait, I, I, I want to know more. But we have to make honest conclusions with what we have. We have to look at the story and say, all right, what's fair? What's honest? What's the story trying to tell me? What can I take here that's valuable to my life and not just a story to be told and kind of ignored? Well, first, I want you to see that this is a home where faith was aggressively pursued. In Luke chapter 2, they brought Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So without modern transportation, without modern comforts, without wonderful places to stay, they bring him to Jerusalem 
to present him to the Lord. Now, this wasn't bring him to the Lord and the Lord gives you gifts. This is bring him to the Lord and oh, by the way, it's going to cost you something you value. It's kind of like coming to church and the pastor says, all right, time to tithe. Come on, right now. We play nice music, but it's still kind of a holdup. You know what I mean? But it's God's idea. So this was God's idea and they're all about doing what God wants and so they bring Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And then the family went to Jerusalem annually. This is a spiritual and a financial sacrifice. It wasn't a government requirement. Now listen, the, one of the great things about Christianity is you get to act out of your own free will. You get to act in your own best interest and then you get to feel good about having acted in your own best interest and then you get to be rewarded for acting in your own best interest. It's pretty great. It's like Christmas all the time. But this wasn't like when they had to go register for the census. The government wasn't forcing this. They were passionate about their service and their faithfulness to God. So every year they went to Jerusalem. Now, you know the story. It's a little bit confusing of a story. They head back home. <clears throat> they're in their caravan. And they're gone a whole day. And they realize they don't know where Jesus is. He's 12 at this point. They can't find him. So he's not incapable of taking care of himself. And I'm sure that he was an amazing child. But you know what? When you're the parent and your child is 12 and you can't find him, are you happy? No. No. So word gets out. We can't find him. So back they go. And where's Jesus? He's arguing with the priests. He's having a Bible study with the priests and they are mesmerized at his wisdom. But you know what the expectation of his parents was? The expectation of his parents was focused simply. They said, didn't you know we'd be worried? We expected you to be somewhere. We have expectations of you. That's a good lesson for parents today. Then Jesus says, <clears throat> Mom, you should know I'd be doing what God wants. So Jesus had learned this lesson at home. What God wants is a priority. Mom, you can relax. I don't understand all, all the ways that fits because on the surface it seems a little rude to me the way it's written, but still it reflects one focused thing. In this home, Joseph and Mary and Jesus and the brothers and sisters, obeying God was a first priority, not a competing priority with other things. Serious conversations about God and his expectations were normal. Mom, didn't you know I'd be doing God's business? Mom, we've been talking about this. It's part of our home. And then it says in verse 50 that they went back and Jesus was subject to to them. Now that's a wonderful life model that shows how a home is supposed to work. Jesus was the Son of God. Could he have taken care of himself? Yeah, he could have. Would he have gotten any trouble? Nope. Would he have gone hungry? Nope. Would he have been unsafe? Nope. But he goes home and he says, Mom, Dad, you're in charge. I accept that as the way life's supposed to be. Now, if that was good enough, you know, I, I, I remember believing earnestly that I was so much smarter than my parents. Do any of you have any memories like that? Believing you were so much smarter than your parents? Come on, you Zumdahl kids, admit it in front of the family. Ha <laughs> ha. 
And then, isn't it amazing, you know, about the time you go from 15 to 25, the parents get so much smarter. But the expectation in this home was that things are supposed to work a certain way, and Jesus didn't say, well, I'm smarter than you. I was there at the foundation of creation. Could you imagine if he talked to his parents like God talked to Job? Hey, Job, where were you when I laid out the stars and the skies and the oceans and all that stuff? He just said, okay, going home with you, Mom. Going home with you, Dad. Going to do whatever you say. So this was quite a home. Now it seems that we know one more thing, and then you hear nothing more about Joseph. It's believed he died young, and you read more about Mary, but you see nothing about him, but we know this. Joseph remade their lives and their reputation as a carpenter. It's all we know. And we know that because in this story that we read where Jesus is finishing the parables, the, the people who were speaking to him, the scribes and the Pharisees who were always harassing him, wanted to mock Jesus. And it, it's not entirely clear in, in the passage, but most scholars believe that when they ask this question, uh, isn't this the carpenter's son that it's really intent on mocking him it's not a compliment that he comes from this family it's a question about his heritage it's a question about how he was born what they imply is that Jesus claimed to be God's son is phony remember Jesus wasn't obscure in his claims he was claiming to be God's son he was claiming that before Abraham was I am. And the Greek is even more powerful. Jesus says repeatedly, where we read I am, Jesus says, I, I am. He's making it clear. He knows what his identity is. He's not having a crisis. Well, what they want to say is, Jesus, you're a phony. We know that you came from a relationship that was polluted. We know that your life of your parents has been scandalous. And uh, even... 30 years later, they did not want to let this go. Basically, the attitude was, he's just the son that came uh, from a scandal between Joseph and that young woman telling her wild story. Oh, it's a virgin birth. Yeah, sure. Now, the life, their life, was rebuilt two ways. One is, they don't lose hope for a better day. So many stops along the road. I think it would have been easy for Joseph to say, hey, I've had enough of this man. It would have been easy to say, you know, I got this girlfriend and I thought things were going to work out so nice and now we got all this pressure and all this drama. I just don't want to deal with it. I'm just going to put her away quietly and I'm going to go home. Could have been the end of the story for Joseph. But when you don't lose hope for a better day and you keep pressing forward, you find that God works in ways that are more than what you ever anticipated. And so at each step where they could stop, he doesn't stop. At each step where they could become disheartened and quit, they don't quit, they press on. Other countries, other communities, other opportunities, other critics... They press on. They don't lose hope for a better day. And secondly, Joseph uses the gifts God gave him and the skills that he developed. Okay, here we are at Christmas. Anybody get anything good for Christmas? Anybody get anything you're excited about for Christmas? Tell me, somebody. What'd you get? coffee machine hallelujah how many of you would praise God from the most earnest part of your heart for a coffee machine (laughs) glory to God what else candy Candy. Steve Burley got candy yes Connor oh that is awesome a Lego train When I come over to your house, I want you to build something for me, okay? 
I want to see your Lego train. That's cool. You going to play with that Lego train? Yeah. Okay. What? Coal. Ken got coal. Some things are a constant in this world. Who else? Come on. Leona? Pictures in a purse. Listen. Every man in the room knows that his wife didn't have a, if his wife didn't have a purse, we'd be in trouble. We may tease about those things, but magic things come out of those purses. They're, somehow they defy time and space. More can come out of the purse than looks like can go in. So, will we use these gifts? Yes. Will our lives be better because of these gifts? Yes. That's the idea. Joseph says, all right, I've relocated. What am I going to do? Am I just going to be a victim? Am I just going to talk about how unfair this is? Am I just going to talk about how God didn't treat me as well as God treated somebody else? Joseph said, no, I am going to use my gifts. I am a carpenter. I am a hard worker. I am skilled. I'm going to use my gifts and I'm going to teach my son. I just wish we had one fancy piece of furniture that Jesus made. Wouldn't you love to see the scroll work on that thing? I always wonder, you know, when Jesus was in the shop and something wasn't going right, do you think there was ever an inclination to want to just say, all right, nobody's looking be a table. I think he had some mischief. Anyway, so Joseph rebuilds their lives very simply. Step by step, hard effort, hard work, sacrifice of time, he uses the gifts God gave him. Folks, that's how every life is built. That's how the church is built. The lessons for Christians are simple. Don't lose hope for a better day. You know, one of the hard things about being a long-term pastor is that you're not in it for a short time. It's not just a cup of coffee. It's your life and you love people and you watch them struggle and you watch them experience losses and you watch them suffer and it's hard but I say to them and I say to you there's a better day coming and it isn't necessarily the day after you die life can be richer life can be better if life has been broken it can be restored Christians have hope for a better day obedience to God brings a better day I bet if we go, go to heaven and find Joseph and we say Joseph you got a lot of regrets about all the stuff you went through Joseph's going to say no man I got no regrets God was faithful to me in every step And secondly, use the gifts God gave you and the skills that you develop. You know, as we are rebuilding this church, the thing that I'm reminded of constantly is we have what we need. We have each other. We have the potential to grow. We have the potential to use our gifts. We have the potential to love each other, lift up and care for each other. And we have the potential to reach out and draw new people to our church. You say, well, Pastor, all that's hard. Yeah, that's right. It's all hard. Isn't that great? Think about it. As much as it's easy to be flippant and say, oh, I just wish it was all easy. How many things in life do you have that you value that were just so easy? How many stories do you want to hear retold where the person just fell into it and it was all so easy? 
No, what we want to hear is how this person overcame challenge and this person met adversity and this person overcame and this person had faith and trust. God gifts us. God gifts us so we will build the lives and reputation that will give honor and glory to His kingdom. The same lessons are true for a church. Ephesians chapter 4 says God gives people gifts. It goes on to say these gifts should be used in His work. The question that I hope goes with you after Christmas is a simple question. It's this. What will I do with my gifts? I don't necessarily mean the things that are under the tree. I mean... God's given you a life. God did not give you that life to waste. God gave you that life to invest. And this is one of those places that life is supposed to be invested. Your family is one of those places that life is supposed to be invested. The priorities that God gives you are the places that life is supposed to be invested. What will we do with our gifts? Will we just congratulate ourselves? Will we sit back and take it easy? I hope not. Because the opportunity, being a person who's so gifted and having a God who promises to reward so lavishly, the opportunity is unbelievable. Will Jesus Christ and the church, the church which is His work, by the way, be a secondary consideration on a list of competing options? Or will we serve God first and allow other things to be secondary? Now, if you choose to be passive about your relationship to God, I'll love you. You'll always be welcome in this church. But as kindly as I know how, I want to say, that isn't all you want. That isn't all you hope for. God made you to serve Him. And your heart can only truly be complete when He is first. Your gifts can only truly be satisfying when He's your first option. That's the story of Joseph. Four weeks. If you would have told me several years ago I could talk about Joseph for four weeks, I'd have said you were out of your mind. But that's the way the Scripture is. When we look at it, when we're serious about it, God's willing to show us things that benefit us and help us to use our gifts. So as this Christmas, in this Christmas, as we reflect on how truly rich we are, how many of you are going to have a nice meal today? We're going to go to my mom's. My mom's a tremendous cook, even though she's not well. So I'm really excited. You you know I think preaching is important when we didn't have a 10-minute service when my mom's cooking. Okay? But you know what? If we would have had grilled cheese and tomato soup, that would have been a better meal than most of the world's going to have today. You say, Pastor, these pews are hard. I know it. Why do you think I sit on this cushioned chair? You're supposed to laugh now. Come on. I know the pews are hard, but the truth is we worship in a nicer facility than most of the world could ever imagine worshiping in. On and on it goes. We are gifted economically. We are gifted socially, but more importantly, we're gifted spiritually. The opportunity to invest those gifts lives with us every day. Let's make sure that we're like Joseph when we use our gifts. Let's stand together and pray. Heavenly Father, as we sing this last song, Joy to the World, May our lives truly be characterized by joy. May we put away anger and bitterness. 
and frustration over loss and pain. And may we say, God, I just want to figure out what you want me to do. I just want to use my gifts. I just want to be your servant. I just want to make the most of every day because you are God and you are worthy. Be with us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless you all. Merry Christmas.